When you think of Call of Duty, what comes to your mind? Because for me, it's storming Normandy, all gillied up, no Russian, and watching a nuclear bomb shred the concrete skin from buildings as my chopper barrels away from Armageddon. For Halo, I see the Covenant or Silent Cartographer, or in The Witcher, the Bloody Baron and his demonic spawn. And do you know what all of these have in common? It's that they're all quests or missions that defined a game or series and cemented their legacy in our hearts and souls forever. Because as crazy as it sounds, oftentimes the core of what determines how much we end up loving a game in the first place, or whether or not a series becomes a smash hit, comes down to nothing more than how much the quests and missions speak to us. So today, let's take a look at some of the best in games of all time, the ones that stand out amongst a sea of so many that we'll never forget. I cannot stress enough how underrated and seldom talked about Prey from Arcane Studios really is. For me, it's without a doubt the most underrated game of all time, and a big part of that stems from its introductory mission, which is one of the most legendary starts to a game I've ever seen that will quite literally leave your jaw on the floor with how awesome and unexpected it is. Because as they say, first impressions are everything, and in this case, that certainly holds true. And by the way, I will be spoiling small portions of any of the missions or quests I talk about here throughout the video, so make sure to check the timestamps in the description if you only want to hear me talk about specific games you're interested in or have already played. And also check out the other links in the description as well to my other social medias and the membership program if you want to support what I do here even more and help me grow the channel. I really appreciate all the support. But regardless, right at the start of Prey, you awake to the iconic line, Good morning Morgan, today is March 15th, 2032. And you find yourself in a strange yet oddly elegant room with a computer and expensive desk nearby along with a shower, kitchen, and a great view of the city. You get a call from your older brother and check your email to see that he is CEO of Transstar, a multinational corporation started by your parents, and that you will be having a meeting today to go over a top secret project you're both working on. So you gather your clothes and get ready to head out the back door to an elevator nearby your suite, that way you can go to the top floor of the apartment and take a helicopter all the way over to an office nearby where you find your brother and discover that you are going on a mission to Transstar's Talos-1 facility, a massive space station orbiting around Earth as a guinea pig of sorts, testing out new technology you are heading as the VP of research. But things start to get very weird right after this, as before you're sent on your way, you are put through a series of tests that include things like moving boxes for apparently no reason, trying to hide behind a chair in an open room while being observed, and wacky psychological questions and tests like the trolley problem that seem super out of place. The real insanity begins though right at the end of this testing, when one of the scientists observing you reaches out for a coffee he requested earlier and instead is met with a shape-shifting alien that leaps onto his head and sucks the soul from his body. Immediately gas floods your chamber and you are knocked out cold while hearing commotion in the background. And then, just like that, you awake once again in your bed to the phrase, Good morning Morgan, today is March 15th, 2032. Only this time there is no friendly call from your brother, only horrifying shrieks and a bizarre sense of uneasiness. In fact, when you go to check on your personal computer this time, you only see messages yelling at you to escape from a mysterious person named January rather than the standard work exchanges. Now royally creeped out, you step into the hallway of your apartment building and discover a dead body of a maintenance worker with a wrench lying on the ground next to them. And getting even closer, it's revealed that the body looks just like the scientist that was attacked before. Something very, very wrong is obviously going on. And when you try to use any of the doors or elevators, nothing's working. You are completely trapped and alone. So you frantically run around your room trying to figure out what's going on, eventually starting to assault any inanimate object with your wrench in an attempt to find a way out. And this insanity eventually leads you to discovering that by hitting the window overlooking the city with your wrench, or a hidden fish tank outside your apartment, the glass breaks and unveils to you that you aren't actually in a city at all, but rather inside some sort of testing facility with tons of 
machinery and computers that were obviously being used to monitor you in a room that was all fake the entire time. Dread starts to fill your mind as you realize the game is a lot more than you originally thought. And as you start to explore around more, you discover that the elevator, the helicopter, and absolutely everything you saw before was nothing but automated rooms and looking glass technology that made it appear as if you were in certain places when really you were just being escorted around a demented maze like a trapped rat being experimented on. And after diving more into this insane revelation and reading through computer terminals as well as encountering more of those terrifying aliens you saw before, you discover that you actually are already aboard the space station Talos-1 your brother spoke about earlier and that something extremely unusual is happening. I can't stress enough for those of you who haven't already played Prey just how amazing this intro is, and without question, it's one of the best first impressions I've ever had of a game where despite my hate for scary things usually, I was so intrigued and in awe at what just happened on screen that playing more was basically a necessity. I distinctly remember my first time playing this game, I put it down after one hour because it just wasn't clicking, but because of how amazing this first intro mission was, I couldn't get it out of my head and I eventually came back and discovered what's now, in my opinion, one of the best games ever made. And for me, that's what great missions and games should be all about, where the thrill and mystery of it all is so immense that you can't put the controller or mouse down and just get lost in the world figuring it all out. It sets the scene perfectly for what's to come too, and only by the end of the game do you even get the answers fully painted for you, the perfect setup and first mission for such an awesome game. If you haven't already played Prey, and even more so, it's DLC Moon Crash, the best DLC for a game of all time that no one played, please give them both a shot. Cyberpunk 2077 is a game full of amazing and emotionally impactful side stories and character quests. Whether that be finally opening up to Johnny Silverhand at the oil fields, watching Judy cry over Evelyn in the bathtub, or staring at Pan Am work on a car for moral support. And it's because of these exact quests that I always felt the game was so amazing, even from day one when most people lamented it for the bugs. However, despite all of the fascinating quests that focus solely on the side characters and their harrowing and tragic lives, the one that might have stuck with me the most was actually a story about a boy that you never even get to formally talk to, who has suffered one of the most horrifying and tragic things I've ever seen in a video game. Nicknamed The Hunt, this quest takes place shortly after you've gotten partway through the I Fought the Law questline, another personal favorite that tasks you with helping the Perales family with an insane spying situation they're dealing with in their own home. And during that questline, you meet with a man named River Ward, who is a cop who's been hired by the Perales family to assist them with an ongoing investigation. But if you befriend him during your detective work, he will call you again later in the game asking you for assistance, stressing you'll need to meet in person to discuss. When you arrive, he shows you a video from police scanners of Anthony Harris, the so-called Peter Pan serial killer finally being caught after having been pulled over in his car on the street for unrelated reasons. In the video, the serial killer Anthony tries to run away from the NCPD, but is shot mid-stride, forcing him onto the ground and into a comatose state. But for River, the even more haunting revelation from the video is a victim in the passenger seat that falls out mid-encounter, and this mysterious child just so happens to be wearing River's little nephew, Randy's shoes. A boy who recently went missing from his home that River has been doing everything he can to solve. And while the dead body in this serial killer's car certainly wasn't Randy based on his build, it strongly indicates that the poor little kid might have gotten caught up in something really heinous. So River begs you to help him on the case, and you both head over to the precinct for clues, where you discover that in his comatose state, Anthony Harris has not been dreaming, meaning you won't be able to use any brain dance technology to try and experience his thoughts. In order to try and jolt his memory back away, you and River head back to the home of his nephew and his sister, and here you have to confront the boy's mother in her time of grieving and hear stories about Randy as he grew up, all while looking for clues all around the home that might give you a way to turn Anthony's brain back on once again. One of the most sinister things you can find here if you're able to hack into Randy's computer using your intelligence skill is tons of messages between Randy and Anthony, along with a Natalie on darknet and hidden sites, which show how Anthony was able to slowly groom and trick this 
helpless young child into thinking he was his friend, with many messages where Anthony acts sad and helpless and tries to confide in innocent Randy. Luckily though, if you manage to find enough evidence, you can return to the police precinct and jolt Anthony's brainwaves alive again, after which he begins to dream. So against standard protocol and with the help of another member on the force, you're able to view Anthony's dreams as a brain dance, where you are met with visions of his childhood. As a young boy, Anthony was mercilessly made fun of by students and teachers alike, and you get to experience firsthand the physical and mental torture he had to go through in and outside of the classroom. And it's here we also find out that as a young boy, Anthony started to act out by killing small animals and using chemicals he must have gotten from home. Following this, you find yourself in another dream, this time in Anthony's home as a child, where his abusive father mistreats him and the livestock alike, including a cow that he is injecting with serums to kill, all in a massive barn that is presumably Anthony's childhood home, and likely where he found his affinity to work with and kill animals. You watch as day in and day out, Anthony is subjected to abuse and aggression non-stop, while surrounded by animals being tortured against their wills. And as if it couldn't get any worse, we finally are transported into Anthony's last dream, this time from a much more recent period where we once again find Anthony in his childhood home and barn, but this time as an adult. Standing up from his chair to the backdrop of ominous sounds and squeals, we watch as Anthony steps out of his office and into the main bay of the barn, and off in the distance we can see something moving. As Anthony approaches, it becomes more and more clear that this something is a human being, a large man crawling and bleeding out against the floor, trying to escape and moaning for help. But instead of finding salvation, he is rather met by Anthony reaching over him and overpowering his drugged out soul. Before you can even fully contemplate all the horrors you've just seen, River will deduce with the clues he's seen from the brain dance, the location in the dreams is a nearby farm called Edgewood. So you run to your cars and speed over and find a massive plot of land filled to the brim with mines and automated turrets as defense. But regardless of whether you go in guns blazing or sneaking and hacking your way through everything, the most horrifying part of the entire quest rears its ugly head here. Inside the barn you find multiple dead bodies, all attached to massive animal machines used to inject cows with copious amounts of drugs, and these prisoners are all tied up and restrained against their will, as these machines pump drugs into and pull the very souls out of their bodies. Frantically, River runs over in search of Randy, and lo and behold, if you've gotten enough evidence and finished things quickly, Randy will still be alive, albeit barely, along with some of the other prisoners as well. More than anything though, the reason that this is the most captivating quest in the entire game for me is because of how raw and intense it all is. It's really rare that the game's medium as a whole even tackles subject matter this dark and bleak, let alone by letting us quite literally dive into the minds of the most twisted individuals in our society. And being able to experience that firsthand while terrifying was also such an ensnaring experience, where it was hard to put the controller down at any moment because you simply had to know what was coming next and how it would all pan out. Because it's that exact kind of intensity that makes a quest in a game so memorable, and certainly is the type of story that will last with you even long after you've completed the game. Dishonored 2 is a game that is no stranger to amazing, intricate, and memorable level design, something Arcane Studios is well known for. And it's because of this that it can be hard to pick just one standout mission amongst a pack of so many greats in this title, including A Crack in the Slab, which tasks you with traveling through time on the fly to solve puzzles and take on enemy encounters. But for me, while A Crack in the Slab is memorable to so many people and oftentimes their favorite mission in the game, on subsequent playthroughs, it can start to get boring with your lack of ability to use powers, and on top of that, there's another game we'll talk about later on this list that handled time travel even better in one of its levels. For me, the mission that was truly revolutionary and cements this game as one of the greats is none other than the Clockwork Mansion. Taking place fairly early on in the story, you are tasked with infiltrating the mansion of Kirin Jindosh, grand inventor to the Duke and creator of the infamous Clockwork Soldiers, impressive adversaries he is trying to build an army of at his estate. And on top of this, another 
another great inventor and ally from the first game, Sokolov, is being held captive and needs rescue. But before getting to the mansion itself, you have to find a way to actually get there, through the affluent district of Karnaka, the Aventa Quarters. You can either slip your way past the guards on patrol into the carriages, or go in with your knife out. But either way, you eventually make your way to the upper district where the mansion is located, and this is where things really start to heat up. When you first make your way inside, you will find a large lever that, if pulled, will transform the mansion in a blink of an eye. As the labyrinthian mega structure starts to twist and conform around you, with entire ceilings, walls, and floors ripping apart to uncover entire new rooms and ways to traverse. But pulling this lever alerts Kirin Jindosh to your arrival, and he'll start sending tons of clockwork soldiers after you. So for especially keen players, you may have diverted pulling that first lever entirely, and instead chose to sneak around without anyone knowing. Regardless of which approach you take though, the genius of the Clockwork Mansion and why it's one of the best video game levels of all time immediately becomes apparent. Every room in this maze-like mansion is full of exquisite and decadent art design and flavor, along with lore and history. But even more interestingly, seemingly every room can be altered or contorted in multiple ways, allowing you to open new passages to unforeseen areas, evade hostiles, and get to hard-to-reach places. Chambers will rotate around in different directions as you have to connect them, new stairways will form as you walk to places you didn't even know existed, and entire sections of the map can only be accessed by squeezing through a small hole in the wall as the walls begin to move around you. It takes the base formula that makes Dishonored so great in the first place, with all of your powers, stealth, and great level design, and just turns it all up to 11. Half the battle in this place is just figuring out where exactly you are and even what's happening, and it quite literally never gets old coming into a room, pulling a lever, and watching an entire labyrinth form in front of your eyes. It makes each new area you stumble into that much more exciting trying to figure out how it all connects, and fits in perfectly with the style of combat present in the series where taking on tons of enemies at once usually is a death sentence. And just watching these scenes play out doesn't do justice to how fun this mission is to play, especially for the first time. And for those of you who have never played the Dishonored series, it perfectly encapsulates why it's one of the most exciting franchises out there, and why immersive sims in general are my favorite genre in games. Seeing the ceiling above you about to close, trapping you in with enemies and teleporting at the last second to the upper level, or sneaking in and out of windows as the building morphs around you is the type of high adrenaline action almost no other games even have on their radar. And more than anything, the Clockwork Mansion fully lets you live out that fantasy of being a superhero assassin that is always one step ahead of your enemies. And considering just how many ways there are to tackle objectives in this mission, it really shows the level of freedom on offer, giving you a sense of being a mouse trapped in a demented maze, while also being the puppet master at the same time. Because in a series like this, defined by amazing level after amazing level, you really have to stand out to make an impression this strong, and the Clockwork Mansion without a doubt does so with pure confidence and style. If you haven't already, do yourself a favor and play the entire Dishonored franchise, a series made up of endless levels that could easily have been on a list just like this one. By far my favorite Bethesda game ever made, in my opinion, is Oblivion. And while most of that likely comes down to nostalgia of it also being my first, a big part of it comes from what I think are truly the best quests and factions Bethesda has ever done. Because you see, Oblivion is home to quests where you're transported into paintings and nightmares, Daedric statues that literally come to life, the Shivering Isles and all of its wackiness, or even coming up against the Grey Fox and the Thieves Guild faction questline. But out of all of these journeys, none are cool and more feral than the Dark Brotherhood. You originally get recruited into this foreboding murder cult if you have killed an innocent person in the game, and when you fall asleep for the next time, you're awoken by a mysterious figure and message beckoning you to join a secretive organization. This eventually leads you down the path of joining the Dark Brotherhood proper, and it's here you get to meet Ochiva, the head of the Sanctuary of the Guild in one of the major cities. And after earning more of Achiva's trust, she eventually tells you she is sending you on a special mission, where you will need to travel to the sprawling city of Skingrad to meet with another cult member named Fafnir, who holds the key to grant access to a very special building. Ochiva tells you that the Brotherhood has lured in a handful of people who have wronged the organization into this building, and told them that they all must remain locked inside until someone finds hidden treasure that will make them rich, playing into all of their immense greed. But your orders are much more sinister. 
sinister. Instead, you are instructed that you will need to kill all of the guests, ideally without any of them finding out, after which the building will be unlocked and you'll be free to go. And while the setup for this quest is somewhat absurd, it's also so awesome for a faction mission in a game like this, and leads to maybe the best quest in all of Elder Scrolls, and potentially even the most memorable in Bethesda history. Stepping inside, you are immediately greeted by a small Nord woman named Matilde Petit, who helps you get acquainted with the other four guests and inquires about who you are. If you so choose, you can even right at the start here reveal to her that you're an assassin and she will simply just laugh it off, albeit much more wary of you in the future. And so begins your journey on how to figure out how to kill all of these combatants without them even knowing. The reason this quest is so fantastic though is all of the intrigue that takes place while you're on your path getting there. Each of the guests has a disposition to you that can be improved or destroyed depending on your discussions with them and others trapped in the house. And as you talk to everyone more, you get to see the dynamics of the place. That being who is friend and foes alike, who are secret lovers, or who's about to break out into all-out brawls. Simply walking around the estate and listening to the other NPCs engage in conversation is super fun, and the amount of permutations and dialogue here is staggering, where depending on each of your relationships with each character, it can drastically affect how you speak with all the others. So the whole thing becomes a massive set of mind games of sorts, where you will be turning certain people against one another while trying to ally with the rest. And this crazy game of murder chess becomes even more interesting as you start inflicting pain on your victims. Because if discovered, the others will start to freak out about a killer amongst them, and it's your job to convince everyone it's not you, which can result in situations where you can even make other characters kill each other because they assume you're telling the truth about who the murderer really is. It's such a great and varied quest that without a doubt is just Bethesda at their best. Open sandbox levels with interesting NPC dialogue and AI that all interact in wild and weird ways, and even for all the faults this quest still has, it goes to show what Bethesda can do with some actually good writing and a solid setup. Even the ways in which you can kill the guests are so varied and wild too, like convincing poor Matilda Petit to check the downstairs cellar for something while everyone else is away, after which you follow her in and leap on her like a lion chasing its prey. And watching the insanity and antics that ensue as everyone starts to doubt each other is hilarious knowing full well the entire time that you're the killer at large. It's the type of thing I wish Bethesda would do more in their recent games, and more than anything, I hope we can get some really memorable quests like this in The Elder Scrolls 6, because for me, that's what makes me think about and write about a game, even decades later from its initial release. Hi-Fi Rush is an absolutely amazing game that not enough people have played, but if there's one mission in this title that accentuates everything that makes it so great, it's without a doubt Track 11. The Needle Drop. Taking place right before the ending sequence of the game, the Needle Drop starts with you and your motley crew of lovable characters trapped in a force field after being tricked by the main villain, Kale Vandalet. With all hope seemingly lost, the crew starts to freak out about what to do while the player character Chai struggles to reconcile with the fact that he doesn't have his main weapon, his guitar, on hand. But being the relentlessly positive force he is, Chai realizes that he doesn't need his instrument. That the powers he had never came from the outside, but within. And a cutscene starts to play out where you can see all of the nostalgic moments with the characters you've met throughout the game as the music swells into the scene and roars to attention. All the characters begin to harmonize together and realize that the power of friendship was always what mattered most. Reaching a tune together to break the sound barrier locking them away, after which they all gain a huge sense of momentum and intensity. And just when you thought the scene couldn't get any cooler or more sentimental, experiencing all these characters come together as a crew finally help one another, they all then join forces with you at the helm to go take on Vandalay. And right when you assemble, almost like a moment from the Avengers, a badass track begins to play at full blast while you all start barreling towards your enemies. And I can't express just how euphoric this level feels as you and your companions rush across each part of the stage helping one another. At one second you can call on Macaron to knock down a pipe to walk over it, and in the next second Peppermint and Corsica are working together putting aside their differences to take down foes. And at the center of it all is that music that continues to propel itself into your eardrums as you bop your head back and forth fighting and platforming your way through massive mega structures and enemies alike. It's Hi-Fi Rush at its very best, with one of the most heart-pumping songs in the game, the most sentimental moments, the most intense 
action scenes, and without a doubt, the most adrenaline pumping, feel good 30 minutes you'll ever experience in a video game. But just when you thought it couldn't get any better, the level ends with a massive boss the size of buildings that chases you around the arena, and only by using your entire crew, even Cinnamon, who usually sits out of fights, can you take him down. It's the perfect blend of comedy, action, emotions, music, set pieces, and spectacle that keeps you firmly on the edge of your seat the entire way through. It really feels like the team all cares about each other at this point. Each and every character is so likable and relatable, so seeing it all just explode in this massive fight of teamwork is a moving experience just on its own. Without exaggeration, this level is so good that even for people that struggle to enjoy the game initially, suffering through the earlier levels just to get to this definitive moment is beyond worth it. And considering the rest of the game is fantastic as well, it shouldn't even be that hard to try. But regardless, this is without question one of the best missions in gaming history, and while you do have to play the entire game almost to get to this moment, and for the context to hit as hard as it should emotionally, the journey is a must play because truthfully, the entire game is fantastic too. So if you like games mostly for the fun they provide, for the smiles they put on your face, or just because they make you feel happy and entertained, there's no better mission you could possibly treat yourself to than Track 11 in Hi-Fi Rush. I've always had a special place in my heart for the Borderlands series. I distinctly remember as a kid picking up the first game and playing with my friends every day after school and on the weekends. And considering it was my first looter shooter ever, I was utterly addicted. Finding new guns from bosses and adjusting my build was a daily event. And when the second game released, it improved on the first in pretty much every way imaginable. Along with these improvements too were tons of memorable quests with the best writing the series has seen by far. But amongst these, there was one huge standard out, a quest that literally only takes one minute to complete, yet in that one minute manages to make you laugh like so few quests can. Titled Kill Yourself, the quest is given to you from none other than the main adversary of the game, Handsome Jack, and just as the name implies, requests that the player jump off a ledge in order to off themselves and receive a reward from good old Jack. This is about as simple as a quest can get, but the short and lackadaisical execution is just so well done and taps into all the types of humor that make this series so great in the first place. In fact, instead of telling you why this quest is so fun and funny, considering how short it is, I'll just show you instead. But if you want a huge reward, you jump off that cliff and become my bitch. Take your time. Huh. Head back to the bounty board and I'll pay you. But, uh, just one second. No matter what happens, I just want you to remember one the thing. Hyperion Corporation sure none of that you killed yourself because you paid you to. You're a bitch. All right. Off you go. The Witcher series can be overwhelming at times with the amount of deep, thought-provoking, and dark quests it has, all of which hit such a high bar of writing quality that most other studios couldn't even begin to match. And for the third game especially, this results in countless unforgettable quests, from taking part in a wedding and helping a bearing botchling dynamic duo, to quite literally traveling through time and space between dimensions, to worlds unlike anything you've ever seen in pursuit of a great evil. And it's because of this that it can be hard to pick just one legendary quests from the bunch, especially when you include all the fantastic DLCs where truly you can't go wrong with any of the missions. For me though, the one quest in this series that really left its mark was Possession in the Isles of Skellige. You first pick up this quest while speaking with the main ruler in the region, who tells you that his daughter Ceres went off on a quest to become worthy of becoming Skellige's new ruler by helping another Jarl named Uldric, who supposedly is under a curse. So you proceed to travel over massive amounts of land and sea to reach Svorlag, where the Jarl resides. And it's here you stumble upon him and his advisor Hort talking about some extremely peculiar dreams a Jarl is having. You see, the Jarl is very upset and refuses to talk to you. But if you converse with Hort, you can figure out that Ceres could be in a bunch of different places that you must ask around and see. And if you do, you're pointed eventually towards a haunted structure up on a hill overlooking the city. When you go to this house, you will be greeted with disturbing 
soothing sounds and imagery, but also a passed out series in the middle of the home. And after you drag her outside and get her awake, she tells you she is aiding Uldric by coming to this house to find his family sword Brockvar, which she believes is the reason the curse is afflicting Uldric in the first place. You see, the sword was originally given to Uldric's younger brother, Aki, instead of the standard custom of it going to the firstborn. And in rage, Uldric broke sacred Skellige law and questioned the decision openly, after which he was punished for days. Following this, Uldric and Aki were sent to the sea to go fishing, and to mend ties with one another. But a massive storm hit and Aki fell overboard while Uldric had his hands full with the sails. Or at least, that's how the story goes. Many in the town believe it was actually a purposeful killing by Uldric due to his jealousy, but others think it was a mere accident. Either way though, Ceres requests that you take the sword which you find in the haunted house to Aki's body in the sea and return it in order to lift the curse. And while retrieving it from the house, you experience multiple horrifying shadow creatures following you and watching you but no full-on attacks just yet. Then, when you return to Uldric to tell him of the news, he simply decides to ignore you, after which you set out to the sea in search of Aki. Luckily, he isn't too far off the coast, and when you do find him, all you have to do is fight off some sirens and swim deep underwater to give the sword to him on his dead body, hoping that all should be good now. But as you encroach toward the land again, it becomes obvious that things are anything but good. There are screams and shouting coming from the Jarl's building, and when you go inside, you can find Uldric with one of his eyes poked out and bleeding profusely. And after questioning everyone around him, you quickly discover that the man has done this heinous act to himself. Uldric proclaims that he heard the gods' voices in his head and that they commanded him to poke his eye out, along with many other self-harm acts that were done before this, all under the immense guilt he has felt for his actions. Him deciding not to join you on returning the sword to his lost brother, in this case, is what lost him his eye. And as they are speaking, Geralt immediately pulls Ceres to the side to let her know that this sounds extremely similar to something he studied in the Witcher School, that being hymns, which are shadowy beings which latch onto a person's guilt and feed off of it, making the host harm and kill themselves for their own pleasure. He instructs Ceres that this can be handled the Witcher way by killing it, or the much more rare and risky way of trying to trick the him at its own game, forcing it to assume a new host with even more guilt than the first. If you decide to use the Witcher way, you simply travel back to the haunted house and engage in all-out warfare with a shadowy being, but if you instead decide to trick the him, things get a lot more crazy. Ceres tells you that she has an idea Idea, and if you agree, she needs you to meet her at the haunted house at a specific time. And when you get there, you wait for a moment, after which she comes rushing in with a baby in her hands, the Jarl's son. She quickly thrusts the baby into your arms and screams at you to throw the baby in a nearby hot oven and lock it shut. Geralt is immediately appalled and freaked out by this notion and has no idea what is going on, but she screams in your face to do it, and a timed cutscene appears with almost no countdown where you have to decide to let the baby live or throw this innocent toddler into a scorching hot oven. And as any good father would, Geralt decides to fling this adolescent being into the oven and lock it shut, right as Uldric and his legion of troops come sprinting up to the house. You have to fight off the enraged men and their leader while the baby screams. And as Uldric approaches the oven with tears in his eyes and rage on his face and screams of asking you why you would do such a horrible thing, Geralt is overcome with an immense feeling of guilt. And right at that moment, the hymn unravels from its hiding in the shadows and attempts to latch onto Geralt, right as Ceres appears from behind the furnace with Hort holding the baby in perfect and pristine condition. Now unable to latch onto Geralt, who has realized he was tricked and not a real baby killer, is left in the open and free to attack, which Geralt does swiftly. You see, Ceres tricked you knowing it was the only way to get enough real and genuine guilt to lure the him out and it worked. And after this, you can talk with everyone involved and get some more backstory on the whole ordeal, but overall, this is just such a legendary quest because to me, it's everything The Witcher is all about. Twists and turns you don't expect, dark narratives, and stories that refuse to just be sunshine and rainbows, but rather dive into the most twisted parts of the human condition, all while fighting really interesting and cool monsters. And most of all, it's a quest that you won't be forgetting anytime soon, with a ton of choices and meaningful consequences packed in. If you were to ask me what the single best FPS campaign of all time was, without hesitation or thought, my answer would immediately be Titanfall 2. And with praise like that, you would expect the game to have a lot of amazing levels. 
And well, it does, where seemingly every single moment or every mission is an absolute joy to play, full of fast-paced action and wall jumping throughout. But even in a title so filled to the brim with exhilarating content like this, there is one specific mission that stands out amongst the rest, one so good and so unique that it easily finds its spot amongst some of the greatest levels of all time across all games. And that level is Mission 5, Effect and Cause. Taking place midway through the campaign, Effect and Cause sees us as the player and our trusty mech best friend BT7274 stumbling upon an abandoned and destroyed Ares Division research facility that was conducting experiments on time dilation and warp anomalies. The mission starts like any other though where nothing crazy is going on, and BT and you as the pilot split up to cover more ground and figure out what's going on at the facility. In no time though, you start to experience strange hallucinations of the past where you will see robots walk walking around the facility, or scientists talking about their experiments, only for seconds later your vision again to return to the modern day, with the rundown chambers on fire in the same exact locations. It's obvious something very strange is going on, but it's only once you acquire a device called the Time Gauntlet that you really see what makes this level so amazing, and why it's one of the greatest levels ever made without debate. You see, the Time Gauntlet is a wrist-mounted high-tech device created by some of the researchers at the base, and allows its user to transfer their body and consciousness between two time streams instantly on the fly, meaning the past and present. And when traveling from one time stream to another, you effectively pause the other, meaning you can use this device to instantly travel to and from the past in order to get whatever you need to get done. The concept on its own is absolutely awesome, but it's also one that a lot of other games like Dishonored 2 or Singularity have done as well. What makes Titanfall 2's implementation of time travel so amazing is just how fluid and kinetic it all is. This isn't something boring like Starfield's Entangled mission where you just travel through time by walking up to an orb and waiting for a scene around you to change in a pre-planned puzzle of sorts. This is unfiltered, unrestricted, time switching at breakneck speeds, on the fly where at any point during the level you can instantly swap time periods in order to evade or fight enemies, climb on walls around you, or open up new passageways. Without having to even play this level yourself, you can see from just gameplay alone why this is so astounding in Titan fall specifically. The ability to climb on walls endlessly while jetpacking and sliding around the level means you can mid-jump swap between time periods to then land on another wall, run across that wall while shooting enemies, and then when a rocket is fired at you swap back to the other time period to then jump into another wall in another room that was blocked before and then slide down that wall while mid-slide teleporting back to the previous time period to then shoot the rocket to make it explode and kill everyone, stabbing the enemy that just fired in the back and then teleporting again to land safely on a platform that existed in the past where now in modern times there's nothing but fire on the ground. This is literally the super agent action thriller wet dream come to life and makes you feel like a complete badass because of how quick you're able to transition between time periods, allowing you to not only solve puzzles in interesting ways like other games with time travel, but also to experience the absolute pinnacle of action in video games. And adding this element of time perfectly fits into the already immaculate Titanfall formula, and the fact that this level is so short is almost criminal for how fun and legendary it is. But in a lot of ways, that's what makes Titanfall 2 so special in the first place, its unwavering focus on making sure nothing overstays its welcome, and undying need to make sure everything constantly feels fresh and exciting. To me though, this is without a doubt one of the best video game missions of all time, one where you will have a smile grinning ear to ear for the entire time, in awe of what's happening on screen and how awesome and cool you feel after every engagement. And trust me when I say this, if you haven't played Titanfall 2 yet, every single mission is one that could be on a list like this and effect and cause is just the crown jewel in a sea of gold. The Fallout series is no stranger to absolutely shocking, absurd, and thought-provoking encounters. Be it cannibals hiding in plain sight, a cult worshipping an atomic god that praises them with irradiation poisoning, or any of the numerous twisted and sinister vaults full of experimentation on live human beings. But maybe the most riveting and legendary quest of them all comes from Fallout 3 with a questline titled Oasis. You see, Fallout 3 especially is known for its drab color palette and never-ending sense 
sense of dread and doom everywhere you go in the world. But if you happen to be wandering in one specific section of the map, you may stumble upon what seems to be little ferns and green plants starting to pop up all around the area. So if you follow this trail of growth, you eventually end up at what is known as Oasis, a sprawling town full of healthy and growing plant life along with a series of cultists. And as anyone who has played the game knows, this is a really fascinating moment because for the first time in your entire playthrough, you actually get to be in a place that isn't defined by drab dirt and abandoned buildings, it's a huge change of pace. But once inside, you speak to a man known as Tree Father Birch, who along with other cultists keeps telling you about this strange quote unquote he who has been calling you to their colony, and that you will need to drink from the sap in order to speak to him. If you decide to do so, you're eventually led to none other than Harold the source of all the flourishing plant life, an ancient talking tree that has suffered from massive radiation poisoning after the bombs fell and mutated, and also a character we originally met in Fallout 2. If you speak to him, Harold expresses his need to die, how he has struggled for hundreds of years now being stuck in this one spot at no fault of his own, and even in his speech you can see that he is starting to go crazy with boredom and sadness. He tells you that deep underground beneath him lies his heart, and that you need to destroy it in order Order for him to finally be set free from his eternal prison. But things aren't so simple, because after this when you go back to talk to Tree Father Birch and another cultist named Laurel, you learn that the colony is actually split on what to do. Some want to apply a birch sap to Harold in order to stop his growth but keep him alive, maintaining the secret of the village while also maintaining the prosperity they've had. Others want to apply a liniment to Harold, which would only accelerate his growth and potentially, with it, the rebirth of a flourishing world. And if you're especially evil, you can even decide to now take your flamethrower out and burn Harold alive at this point, watching him scream in agony while the cultists attack you in rage. Regardless of the choice you make though, this quest is so interesting because of the grey moral choices it provides. If you decide to fulfill Harold's wish and destroy his heart deep underground, you might be dooming the lives of not only these strange hippie cultists, but potentially millions of others that would have survived with a world full of regrown forests like this. But if you choose to keep Harold alive for the cultists, or even the world's benefit, you are dooming this poor creature to an eternity of hell that he doesn't even fully understand. And this question only gets further complicated by the fact that if you speak to Harold more, you learn that he is slowly gaining power from the trees around him, being able to hear and see from their branches, implying he is gaining more and more authority over time. So maybe even that proposed utopia of the future would actually be nothing more than a nightmare forest run by a tyrant tree with a vendetta. The choice of of what to do now becomes extremely hard to make, and it really forces the player to sit back and think about what to do next. This isn't a simple question of should I be evil and blow up a city with a nuke inside of it, or should I be a goody two-shoes and leave it unarmed? This quest really has no right answers, and makes us ponder about the needs of the many over the needs of the few and the implications of each. And being able to just explore the area and talk to lots of townsfolk about this conundrum is just such a fun way to set up this whole adventure. For example, if you speak to a young girl named Sapling Yu, she will tell you about how she always talks with Harold and tries to keep him company, and if you speak to Harold about her, he almost starts to look and sound happy for a moment, feeling at ease knowing someone out there really cares about him and his well-being. It really is just Fallout at its best, which is ironic considering this is one of the least Fallout adjacent locations in the entire series, full of greenery, happiness, and flourishing life. And even all of the different endings you can get here really make you you stand back and think about what happened. Like one where you can side with the townspeople and help Harold grow more, only for him to feel guilty about his request before, saying it was his duty to help people survive and not be selfish. Which implies killing him before may have been the wrong choice after all, but we'll never really know. Regardless though, it stands as one of the most legendary quests of all time, and a series that seems to produce so many. Death Stranding is one of the most divisive games out there, and for good reason. Walking around massive open environments and oftentimes doing little more than trying not to trip over that next big boulder while hauling massive cargo can be a mind-numbingly boring exercise for many. But the thing about Death Stranding is the beauty of this game comes from those moments of brevity in between all the tedium, where you just look out into a stunning world and take in all the sights and sounds. And there's one specific mission early on in the game that accentuates everything the title is trying 
trying to accomplish so perfectly, and shows why not every mission has to be about daring set pieces and massive explosions. And that mission is order number 14, Port Knot City. After having a brief stint with the invisible goo-like alien menace before, and trying your hand at a few high-profile deliveries across multiple kilometers, you finally get the first big mission to deliver some important cargo to a nearby port facility that ships goods across the newly developed waterways of America that formed after a catastrophe. The problem with this delivery though is that not only are you going to have to carry a fair amount, making your character slower and less silent on top of making traversal more difficult, but also you're going to have to make your way up a massive hill in order to get there, one littered with those pesky invisible demons. So you set out on this massive venture not quite knowing how it will go down, carefully walking across rivers, and taking in the extravagant nature all around you. And it's only when you finally get to the hill that you encounter your first major enemies. Every step you make and even a tiny bit of sound causes them to become more alert. So you have to move as slowly and carefully as possible up this massive mountain, all while holding your breath and only taking small breaks in between massive rocks you can hide behind. It's a super thrilling sequence in general and heightens the tension to a major level, but the real best part of this mission and why it's so memorable is still yet to come. Because after finally making your way past these enemies into the top of this hill, you are met with a massive sprawling view at the top of a mountain with steep cliff edges at every side leading all the way to Port Knot City adjacent to the coast. And just as you're starting to take this amazing view in, the best in the game up to this point, a song starts to blare through your speakers, one of pure beauty and resonance that seems to almost fill the void of the canyons below with its melody. And for the first time in the game, you really start to understand what makes it so special. Simply looking out into the distance and seeing such a barren and dead world come to life, along with that sense of cold from the environment and warmth from the song that unite into pure bliss. You see, the reason this mission is so legendary isn't the fun combat or cool action sequences, it's because of the beauty of it all. A song so powerful that you can't help but feel emotional, especially after such an arduous journey beforehand. So as you start to slowly make your way down this massive cliff face using ladders and ropes, it just feels unlike any other game out there you can play in such a unique and powerful way. I know people always talk about Kojima and why they love him, especially for the Metal Gear series, but for me, this mission right here in Death Stranding shows just how artistic and meaningful games can be even when there's no combat or dialogue happening. And it's missions like this that lead people like me to fall in love with the medium so much and make videos about games in the first place. Missions that are so full of love and passion that it can practically be felt oozing from the screen. And that isn't even to mention the absolutely insane and unbelievable boss battle that happens at Port Knot City once you finally get there that is a cherry on top of what is already a defining moment and mission in a game. A mission that takes you from humble and slow beginnings, to nerve-wracking stealth sections, to scenes full of emotion and grandeur, all culminating in one of the craziest things you've ever seen, and a boss that quite literally tears the world apart as you struggle for dear life. You know, a lot of people don't like Death Stranding that much and talk about how they just don't get it, but I would venture a guess that there's a very strong possibility that these people didn't get far enough to see this mission play out in full, because when you do, you realize that you're playing something really special that so few other studios are even trying to make. To this day, it still pains me that almost no studios are making giant, big-budget sci-fi games with sprawling universes, or when they do, oftentimes they come out less than stellar. But despite the propensity of failure, there is one series that managed to capture the magic this genre is capable of, and is none other than Mass Effect, one of the best sci-fi universes in all of fiction, not just games. The original trilogy to this day is beloved by millions, and along with that comes a huge list of memorable quests and missions that cemented it as one of the greats. For a lot of people, their top pick would be something like the final mission from the second game, where you can lose or save your entire squad before going out into the third title. For some, it would be priority to Chanka or the Citadel in Mass Effect 3, and how they both handled build-up and payoffs alike so perfectly, along with showing some of the fan-favorite locations in the whole series. For others, it would be one of the greatest villain reveals and mission structures in game's history, with Vermeer from the first installment, which by the way, I almost chose as well. But for 
me, I actually have a different mission that in my opinion is everything that Mass Effect should be, everything that makes it so amazing, and also the mission that made me fall in love with the series forever, all wrapped into one, Novaria. You see, partway through the first game, you were given Spectre status on a massive space station called the Citadel, making you a special agent of sorts for the strongest governing body in the entire galaxy, the Council, and following this, your commanding officer Anderson steps down and gives you full power over the SSV Normandy, a prototype deep scout frigate with new highly classified stealth tech. Anderson and your new allies inform you of three urgent missions you will need to tackle in order to figure out what's going on with a mysterious artifact you found at the beginning of the game, along with finding out what happened to another Spectre, Saren, who's gone rogue. One of these three missions is Novaria, a massive icy planet that is private council territory home to top secret high-tech research going on into genetics, biology, human augmentation, and much more. When you first land on the planet, you are met by security and a lot of guns, but by proving your Spectre status, they let you inside and inform you that an Asari matriarch named Benezia, working with Saren, has made her way up through the mountains to a research facility called Peak 15. So in order to track her down, you need to make your way to the garage and acquire a vehicle. But in order to do that, you need to figure out how to get a pass to gain access. There are a ton of different ways to do this, all of which involve walking around this massive spaceport and learning about some of the research and craziness going on on this planet. You can bribe a jellyfish alien with an attitude despite being monotone to buy a pass, figure out company trade secrets and extort, or work with an extremely corrupt official and advisor in the colony. But regardless of how you get the pass, this awesome opening to the mission is only the start of what is about to get a lot more crazy, and also provides some really cool lore and a look into the history of the universe and its peoples and the companies within it. And I really wish more games would provide a huge amount of setup for missions and games like this, where it feels like even the low stakes introductory portions provide so much value and make the later reveals that much more interesting because of the immersion and intrigue that it it takes so long to build before. It makes it feel like a real and lived in universe with tons of things going on outside of your main hero's journey. Nonetheless though, after you're able to finally get into the garage, you're attacked by a team of Geth, which are sentient artificial intelligence warriors feared all throughout the galaxy, proving that they must be working for Benezia, meaning you need to get to the vehicle and get to that research facility quickly to figure out what's going on. For the next couple of minutes, you'll find yourself battling armies of Geth and turrets as you speed your way to peak 15 through a giant mountain range. And when you finally arrive, you're forced to go back on foot to get inside, now finding yourself in my single favorite part of the entire Mass Effect franchise, maybe only tied with talking to Sovereign for the first time. And that's because when you step into Peak 15, it becomes immediately apparent that something is very, very wrong. Geth litter the entrance, but after you dispatch of them, you start to notice some weird oddities, like turrets facing the wrong way from what you would expect, abandoned mess halls and rooms that indicate people left in a hurry, along with the logs that imply something very sinister has happened, not just a geth attack. At one point, you can hear the station's virtual intelligence over the loudspeakers telling you that the facility needs to be repaired in order to return to order. And if you're going to get some answers, that will be the first thing to do. Right around this time though, suddenly an army of giant space bugs with massive tentacles burst out of the vents and begin attacking you, turning the sequence into a horror game of sorts. And so it seems we have our answer for what happened on the station. And now you have to fight your way through hordes of these weird alien creatures along with Geth to restore power to the core and find more answers. After doing so, you unlock more parts of the station along with dialogue with the core intelligence system, which leads you to finding a group of surviving researchers on the station barricading themselves in a small portion of the living quarters. You learn that these creepy aliens attacking you and stalking you from before are none other than the Rachni, an ancient fabled race of highly aggressive bug-like creatures that almost wiped out the universe many years ago, but were defeated by Krogan and their ferocious warrior culture. In fact, the the whole reason for the Krogan genocide in the first place was the fact that their numbers grew so high in order to defend against the Rachni invasions, and after the victory, they needed to be dealt with lest a new strong adversary go up against the Council in Citadel space. And I can't express just how fascinating learning about all of this lore for the first time was, and it really goes to show that sometimes the best thing a quest can do is give us a sense that the world and universe we're playing in have so much more depth to it beyond just ourselves. And 
being able to talk with all of your companions and make choices here with all of the survivors is peak sci-fi role-playing to me, along with a foreboding ancient Cthulian-like enemy, which I really find so fascinating. The mission isn't quite over just yet though, as in order to help the survivors, you need to track down Benezia and fight her in one of the hardest battles in the entire series, after which you will find the Rachni Queen herself, likely the last hope of the Rachni species' survival, trapped in a containment facility. And it's here you have to either spare or kill the queen after she telepathically talks to you through a dead body and professes that the Rachni are actually peaceful but were being controlled. And the decision you make here can have drastic effects not only in this game, but surprisingly, mostly in the third installment, where your decision here will completely change what happens at a certain part of the story. Regardless of that decision though, the final part of this quest is fighting the remaining mind-controlled Rachni and escaping from this cursed planet, after which you will make your way to your ship and take a much-deserved breather. Overall, this is just the exact kind of quest, for me at least, that shows why Mass Effect is such a beloved series. It has everything from an awesome and unique location, tons and tons of world-building and lore, unique and interesting art design, with distinct areas you don't see anywhere else, and an engaging villain with ties to your companions I didn't even mention here, along with choice and consequence and different ways to tackle all parts of the mission that is so long and extended. And for me, it was after completing Novaria on my original playthrough over a decade ago now that I truly understood I was playing something I would never forget, and even to this day still stands as one of the best quests I've ever played in a game. Because despite the jankiness of gameplay and design in the first Mass Effect nowadays, the ideas on offer here are unmatched even to this day, and more than anything, it's a shining example of why sci-fi and games can be so great. Pillars of Eternity will always mark a pivotal time in the gaming industry, where Kickstarter and hardcore classic role-playing game enthusiasts came together to launch multiple big-budget adventures that harken back to the very first legendary RPGs like Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, Planescape Torment, and Icewind Dale, with Pillars of Eternity being one of the first to release. And one thing games like this are almost always known for are their riveting quests or stories that take us on adventures we never forget. And well, Pillars of Eternity is no different. Part way through the game, you stumble upon a very peculiar side quest called Blood Legacy, which you pick up from Lord Harund in Direford Village, where he asks you to find his missing daughter Ailes, who disappeared from this quaint little town some time ago. Making it even more strange though, the Lord fears that the townsfolk may actually be intentionally keeping information from him for reasons unbeknownst to him at the time, so you are tasked with getting involved in this sticky situation. You have multiple options on how you want to tackle this quest at first, but for most people, you'll probably start talking to local townsfolk in order to get more information on Ailes. You can learn from a local innkeeper about secret underground demonic societies rumored to be involved, or from an apothecary named Tendina, you can hear a rumor that Ailes is said to be pregnant, something the Lord seemed to leave out of his initial reporting on the matter. But either way, you eventually are directed to Trigill's shop in the city, where you are told that an ogre is at fault, who went berserk and kidnapped the poor girl. However, if you actually decide to meet this ogre face to face, he is able to confirm that this is all a lie, and confronting Trigill and his friends at the shop with this revelation results in them instantly attacking you. If it wasn't clear already, something sinister is afoot, and don't worry, things are about to get a lot more crazy. Because inside Trigill's shop, you can find an entrance to an ancient underground and sprawling Skane Temple, who is the god of secret hatred, resentment, and violent rebellion in the Pillars of Eternity universe. And if you dive into this underground fortress, you are met with tons of traps and cult members that will kill you on sight, all while being confined to ultra-narrow and horrifying corridors with almost no light to see in front of you. There are tons of treasure pieces and lore clues to be found all over this dungeon, but no matter how long it takes you, you eventually find your way to the final boss room near the center, where you confront the cult leader, Wyman. Wyman reveals to you that Ailes is not in fact Lord Harren's daughter, but actually his niece, and that the rumors of pregnancy we heard above on land are in fact true due to the fact that Harmon brutally assaulted his own blood and impregnated her. Wyman and his cultist brothers are performing a ritual to their great god in order to eventually transform Ailes into a brutal killing machine that will infiltrate and murder the entire family as revenge. And it's here you get to decide whether you want to side with the cult, turning them all friendly and letting you walk right out, or turn against them and their demonic ritual, resulting in a fight killing Wyman, Ailes, and all of the cultists. Technically speaking as well, if you have one of four specific party members or archetypes in your group at the time too, you can instead choose to reverse the 
the ritual and erase Ailey's memories, returning her to her assaulter, none the wiser, and a baby on deck. It's one of the most absolutely horrifying quests that lasts in your memory even long after you've completed it because of how dark and twisted it really is. There honestly is no real happy ending to this escapade, and no matter what you choose to do, people are going to die and suffer extremely harrowing situations. And it goes to show that sometimes you don't need a AAA budget or even full voice acting to craft missions and quests that can truly leave a resounding mark on players. Sometimes the most legendary quests of all are the ones that yes, disturb us, but also make us think about how dark life can really get and make us feel appreciative and happy for the sense of peace and solace we can find in our own lives currently. Halo is a series practically defined by legendary missions, with notable standouts all across each game that any player can think back fondly on. And for the majority of these, they involve massive set pieces, fighting off hordes of enemies, huge cutscenes with badass one-liners that remind you exactly why Master Chief is such an icon, or bombastic space battles that really add a sense of scale to the universe. And it's for that reason I struggled so much on picking just one favorite level. For so long being adamant that it was the Covenant from Halo 3 3 because it just had everything. Epic music, air combat, awesome firefights, heroic cutscenes, and huge story revelations. But what the Covenant and every other mission I pondered on didn't have was something one specific mission from the first game managed to do, that no other level in Halo history has quite the same. You see, for its time, Halo 1 was absolutely revolutionary. The fast-paced sci-fi combat, the huge open level design unlike anything before, and the high production values all on console day one for the original Xbox. It was most gamers' dream at the time and instantly cemented Bungie in the pantheon of the greats, but this first entry in the series was also the first look for many into a world and its characters as well as its adversaries. And in this sixth mission in the main campaign, you get to meet maybe the most iconic enemy in the series for the first time, and boy what an introduction it is. To start off the level, you find yourself in what is called the Flood Containment Facility, somewhere on Installation 04, also referred to as Alpha Halo, which was a set of seven gargantuan ring worlds abandoned by a technologically hyper-advanced and apparently now extinct set of precursors known as the Forerunners. Even your main enemies you have seen up to this point, the Covenant, regard this ring specifically as the first Holy Ring, showing it must hold huge significance. But instead of starting the level directly in the secret research facility, you land nearby in the swamp and must make your way towards it. Immediately though, something is extremely off, because you can see an army of Covenant soldiers soldiers running for their lives away from the facility. These are the same enemies you have been ruthlessly attacked by and hunted down the entire game, and to see them completely giving up all sense of machista is quite the sight to behold. The only other person that can do that to them is Master Chief, and he's an unstoppable super soldier that can literally take on an entire alien race. Nonetheless, you have to wade your way through a mysterious marshland with massive trees reaching to the sky and ominous music playing in the background, after which you eventually find the base and make your way inside. And it's here you find hordes of Covenant that are randomly set up here with lots of defense systems and soldiers, which is strange considering this is a human facility as well. And speaking of humans, you can also find random survivors screaming at you in horror, asking you to get away and not bring the things near them, which you have no idea what they are talking about. But as you keep going room after room deeper into the base, you realize everything is devoid of life, and an ominous lack of sound begins to become noticeable as more dead bodies start piling. Up. The sense of loneliness, though, finally is alleviated by a cutscene where we see Master Chief being hunted by some strange unknown creature in the walls, after which he opens a door to find more dead bodies, one of which he takes the helmet up from to watch a recording of past events. These soldiers were sent in with Captain Jacob Keyes, who you were sent to save at this facility, and in the recording you watch as they first encounter the base, full of dead covenant with strange markings and incisions on their body. They keep making their way deeper into the base where you currently are, and it's here you get to see the first glimpse at the absolute insanity of what's really going on. While surveying the area, a group of marines and their sergeant are attacked by a massive swarm of aliens crawling out of the walls, who latch onto their faces and contort their bodies into mush. 
crash. And just when you think it couldn't get any worse, the recording ends, and right where they were attacked, well, you guessed it, now it's Master Chief's turn. You fight off hordes and hordes of these strange monsters you've never seen before, and make your way further into the base, discovering that these pus-filled monstrosities can even explode and damage you if they get too close. Luckily for us, though, we're Master Chief, and Master Chief never loses, so you eventually are able to find some of the remaining Marines along with Captain Keys and learn that what you have been fighting are actually the Flood, an ancient hostile race of aggressive parasitic monsters that are a threat to the entire galaxy and even the Forerunners before you. And with this newfound information, you help escort the Marines and Captain out and escape to your ship where you will have to figure out what to do next. It's really just such an awesome and unexpected reveal from a game that was so focused on action, and the fact that almost half of the level doesn't even see you shooting a gun, but rather dealing with the horrors in your own mind instead, is so cool. Because you see, what really made this level so special for Halo as a series was how it managed to not only introduce a crazy new enemy to fight and be mesmerized by in upcoming titles, but it also showed the range that Halo can have as a game. Sure, those huge action-heavy levels are fun too, but Halo has endless amounts of that. I could have picked so many from every game. 343 Guilty Spark was the first really big indication that not only was this universe really cool and fun, but also it had a lot of depth to it. And I think the reason Halo is so beloved is because it manages to do both. And this level for me is the most legendary in its history because it did it best. And it really is saying something when a mission more quiet and pondering like this, full of horror and story, can immediately come to my mind just as quickly as ones where you are driving warthogs at breakneck speeds through massive explosions. And things like this are what makes sci-fi memorable even years later. Everyone can do explosions and guns making shooting sounds, but not everyone can hit a deeper chord like this level did. I've always been a huge advocate for the fact that games are better now than they've ever been, and I often argue that people complaining about the industry too much simply are trying to relive the glory days of nostalgia they'll never get back and ignoring all of the amazing things out there. And maybe one of the best recent examples of this is Baldur's Gate 3, potentially the greatest RPG ever made that revolutionized an industry and moved an entire niche genre into the mainstream. And with any game like this, there are bound to be some amazing quests and missions to go on. And considering a runtime that can take well over 100 hours, this game isn't lacking on that front at all. For me though, there is one mission towards the end of the game that was the best of the best, the House of Hope. The mission revolves around by far the coolest villain in the game, Raphael, a mysterious figure who follows you and your party around the entire journey, even in Act 1. And it's in these early acts that you learn this scheming yet charismatic orator is actually a Cambian or devil-like figure. He offers you salvation from a tadpole stuck in your brain turning you into a mind flare if you offer him your soul, which any sane player rejects. However, the real showdown with Raphael doesn't even happen until entering his dwelling, the House of Hope, in Act 3, and boy, what a showdown it is. Your initial desire to find him revolves around the fact that he is in possession of what is called the Orphic Hammer, an ancient weapon you will need in order to break a potential ally out of his eternal chains to help you transition into the finale of the game. But in order to even get it in the first place, you need to get to Raphael. And to do that, you need to find a shop in the lower city of Baldur's Gate called the Devil's Fee. At the front of the counter of this strange and foreboding mansion is a woman named Helsit, who you must coerce into admitting is working for none other than the Devil Raphael. You can do this by finding her diary upstairs using teleportation or flight magic to get to the roof from the outside, considering there's a magically sealed door inside, or you can report her activities to city officials who will cause all manner of trouble. On top of this, you can bribe or persuade her along the way, but no matter what you decide to do from a wide range of options, you eventually get to a point where Helsick will admit that the devil does reside nearby, but you will need to open a portal to the House of Hope by completing a demonic ritual upstairs. So you get access to a strange book which if read is full of rituals and poems of sorts that give you clues on what to do next, which winds up coaxing you into grabbing a handful of items including a skull, diamond, incense, coin, and infernal marble, which you can then place around a summoning circle on the top floor of the building. And once you solve this puzzle, the symbols on the floor expand into a hot fiery orange, after which a massive portal to the land of the devils is open. You step inside and are greeted by a foreboding and elegant home of gold and lavender plated 
waiting everywhere, with dining rooms and tables completely stocked with food and other lavish pleasantries. And along with all of these, you also are met by Hope, the person the place is named after, who is being held captive by Raphael as a servant, but also as someone that will help you get out of here. So you get to walk around this big, new, and unique area, doing all different manner of things, talking to the locals and hearing their stories, or trying to steal ancient armor and weapons that will make you much stronger. Eventually, though, you will get back to your main goal of getting that Orphic Hammer, which you can only unlock by finding a special phrase to recite locked in a safe in Raphael's chambers. So after figuring out how to be granted access to these chambers through a variety of methods, you are met by a body double of Raphael himself that tries to have sex with you. But whether or not you decide to succumb to these devilish deeds, you eventually get your phrase from the safe and head back to the hammer. And once you do steal the hammer, immediately the entire zone will become hostile. But luckily, the room to escape is actually really close by. The hard part of this quest comes from the fact that if you want to save Hope, the girl who was eternally trapped here and helped you from the beginning, you will need to fight your way back through the entire zone and into the basement with one of the hardest combat encounters in the whole game just to save her. And regardless of whether you decide to do that or not, you still have something even greater waiting for you at the end. Because when you return to the portal with the hammer in hand, you are met by Raphael and a team of devils ready to kill you at any cost. And it's at this moment that the best boss battle in the entire game kicks in. Raphael transforms fully into his devilish form at under 60% health, and a song full of loud orchestral strings pierces your speakers as Raphael begins to sing along in his usual mocking yet funny tone you have become accustomed to all game. And so you and your team must fight off hordes of devils, along with Hope if you saved her before. And truly, this is just such an amazing fight and mission. There's even an evil character earlier in the game that can show up here if you killed him and can potentially join sides with you to take on Raphael based on the decisions you have made before this boss fight and during it. And on top of this, the fight really pushes you to use all of your skills and abilities, many of which will be on cooldown in need of a long rest if you've already did a ton of fighting to save hope before. So with your back against the wall, you have to strategize to the best of your abilities to take on a devil himself and take his prized possession from his home. It really is just a perfect example of what makes Baldur's Gate 3 such an amazing RPG. Characters from the beginning of the game finally having their big payoff, charismatic villains singing while hurling fireballs, and engaging in thought-provoking battles that really push you to use everything in your arsenal to win, along with truly meaningful choice and consequence where people you decided to help or save all the way back in Act 1 or 2 can show up here and either fight for or against you. And the craziest part is that there's just so many ways this could play out too. You could have sided with Raphael earlier in the game, you might not have even discovered the history of the Orphic Hammer and the fact that Raphael had it, you might have decided to leave Hope to die in this accursed land, or you might have ended up having sex with everything in sight and screwing up the mission because you're literally banging a body double of Raphael. Stories like this are what make Dungeons and Dragons as a game so bewildering in the first place, and Baldur's Gate 3 managed to capture that magic just right in the House of Hope. For a series known most for its frantic and in-your-face gory gameplay and parkour, it's surprising just how many notable quests there are in the Dying Light franchise. But the one quest that stands out amongst the pack without a doubt is Fan Zone from the first installment. After hearing word from one of the survivors, Noah, in the safe zone about a distress call that was picked up on the radio waves, you can inquire to learn more from him about where this call was coming from. And if you set out to find it, you eventually can get close enough to pick up more of the signal, which apparently was made from a woman and children who are are in big trouble and need supplies in order to survive. Getting extremely close to the building though, you can hear another message loud and clear where a scared man proclaims, for anyone that can hear this, our situation is dire. There are women and children here, we can offer electronic equipment and ammunition in exchange for medicine, food, and drinking water. Please help us. And considering that a massive zombie apocalypse has broken out, thinking about these supposed mothers and children barely having enough food to survive is horribly sad, and it means it likely becomes your top priority immediately. But once you arrive at the actual building where the distress call claims you need to go, things immediately get really strange. First of all, the building is blocked off with not many ways in, and once you get inside you can find an elevator nearby which you can promptly call. However, once inside the elevator, you notice that the walls and ceiling are covered in blood and strange markings. So you take the elevator upstairs and once you arrive at your floor, countless dead bodies and mutilated corpses are strung all about, and you start to fear the worst for what might have happened 
happen to the innocent mother and children, yet something in the back of your mind doesn't feel quite right. You also at this point hear a broadcast clear as day from that same man stating, to anyone who can hear this, your situation is dire. I've killed women and children here. I can offer you death in exchange for medicine, food, and drinking water. Come to me. A chill runs down your spine and sense of dread takes over as you realize that you've been tricked by an insane psychopathic killer into coming into this sadistic place, and that you are now trapped in his domain where he will hunt you down and turn you into another lifeless corpse. The supposed mother and children from the distress call before were nothing but a front, and you have fallen into a trap like a fish out of water. And it's here you must sneak your way around this terrifying prison of sorts until you can find a broadcast room in the building and turn the distress call off to prevent others from succumbing to the same fate. And after you do this, you try to find an escape path out of the building, and during this portion of the quest, you finally come into contact with the psycho serial killer who's been taunting you the whole time. And lo and behold, he's using a high-level police rifle to hunt you down and is a strong adversary. This leads to an all-out brawl where you must take down a man who has mercilessly killed so many innocent children and women, and after beating him, you have to look back and see once again all the devastation he's wrought. Overall, it's a perfect example of a quest subverting our expectations and once again shows that even in a world full of mindless zombie killing machines, the biggest monsters are always still the people that we sometimes call our neighbors. And really, just the whole setup for this quest and how we even get to this murder house is handled so well, where by the time you notice the blood all over in the elevator, you immediately realize you are way in over your head and something crazy is about to happen. Remedy Entertainment are no strangers to fascinating and otherworldly level design with electric themes, whether it be the Wee Sing level in Alan Wake 2 or the infamous Ashtray Maze from Control. But sometimes, the best missions and games don't rely on one standout gimmick or simple shock and awe, but rather, just a perfect sense of execution. And for Alan Wake 2, this execution shows itself best, for me at least, in Saga's fifth chapter, Old Gods. You see, in Alan Wake 2, you get to play out the story of two different characters characters in their own timeline, that being Saga Anderson and Alan Wake from the first game. And even though Alan's levels tend to lean more into the surreal and terrifying, Saga still takes the cake for the most horrifying mission in the whole game, and one of the best horror missions of all time. Partway through her journey through Bright Falls, this FBI agent and crime solver finds herself out of options as her partner in crime Alex Casey has gone missing, and leaders at an undercover top secret organization called the FBC have taken Alan Wake into their custody. Her only option left is to look for some recently discovered family members, and to do so, she has to head over to her nearby creepy mansion known as the Valhalla Nursing Home. Upon arriving, something definitely feels off, where you are first met at the door by Rose, one of the creepiest characters in the game, and also a caretaker at the home, and she shows you around while assuring you that everything is alright. But as you look around more, you discover that this couldn't be any further from the truth. Creepy sounds can be heard all over this three-story building, along with strange shadows and visual oddities always presenting themselves in the corners of your vision. You eventually are able to make your way to finding your grandfather sick in his bed, and here he is able to speak to you directly in your mind and tell you that something very, very sinister is going on here and that you need to stop it in order to save his life. Looking at his comatose body, you realize something needs to happen and happen quickly, and it's soon after this that you stumble upon a woman in her room named Cynthia Weaver who turns out to be a taken or possessed human haunting this house along with other small scares here and there from some of the other residents like Aki. And it's now that you know things have gotten really dire, so you instruct Rose to give you a key to head over to the wellness center nearby in order to investigate further. And it's here you're met with seemingly endless, terrifying jump scares from Cynthia, as she and other Taken start to attack and chase you down as you look for clues on how to help your dying grandfather. This eventually leads you to discovering and opening a nearby overlap, which leads you into the dark place in the Upside Down, where you finally get to face Cynthia head on. You are led through never-ending copy-pasted hallways full of blood and horror as you slowly start to lose all sense of direction and your mind along with it. You have to crawl through rat and water infested holes near the ground and defend yourself from shadows crawling in the dark, all while Cynthia maniacally laughs and taunts you in this twisted nightmare. And only after struggling through this onslaught for some time do you finally make your way to the boss room where you will have to control the water and light sources while you try to take out Cynthia with every little bit of ammo and firepower you have left. It's one of the most adrenaline pumping scenes in the entire game, and while I usually hate games that rely on jump scares like this, here it just 
just works so well because it keeps you on the edge of your seat the entire time and pumps that adrenaline into your veins while you fight with everything you have left, not only to save your body, but your mind to succumbing to pure terror on screen. And more than anything, it's just such a well done horror level with almost everything you could ask for. That intense build up before everything even happens where you simply get to walk around the nursing home worried that something might jump out at you, all while learning so much about the lore and location of the game or talking with nice older folks at the home. Then the reveal that your grandfather has something much more sinister going on, followed by the never ending creepy vibes from Rose and other residents, finalizing in the crescendo of a non-stop horror sequence with Cynthia Weaver hunting down your very soul. It's not a mission that did something super unique like We Sing, but the reason I like Old Gods even more than We Sing is because it just has flawless execution. Where most people remember live music in a game like this the most, sometimes something more simple can leave even more of an everlasting mark. And for me, as someone that doesn't even like horror, especially in games, that sense of intensity I felt running through this mission for the first time was surreal and really made me appreciate the horror genre as a whole that much more. It made me get it in a sense. And since I've been able to go back and fall in love with games like Dead Space as well because of this mission. And it also is just Alan Wake 2 firing on all cylinders, the game at its best, where all the mechanics and combat, puzzle solving, exploration, and horror come together and seamlessly create a level that has a vision and executes on it perfectly. No cute parlor tricks or great music that make it stand out and feel different, just doing what the game was meant to do and doing it immaculately. More than anything too, it shows that sometimes for great missions and quests and games, less is more, and simply focusing on the basics and doing them well can make an entire journey come together. More than any other mission in Alan Wake 2, and most other horror quests and missions out there in general, Old Gods really sets the scene for an unforgettable and intense experience. A mission that's legendary. One of my favorite parts about Elden Ring is, ironically considering this video, that it has a huge lack of traditional quests and missions. Map markers and quest givers or objectives are often swapped out for nothing more than a completely free open world where you must venture out on your own and make your own story. But while the structure of its quests are much different than many traditional games, that doesn't mean Elden Ring doesn't have some of the coolest out there. And for me, the one that left the most of a mark was the journey, or in our case, what we will call a quest, of discovering the ancestral spirit of the Shofra River for the first time. You see, early on in Elden Ring, you can unlock what are called Sites of Grace, which point the way towards the main objective, often causing run-ins with many difficult main bosses. But besides these obvious pointers, most of the exploring of the world happens naturally, where the greatest adventures and stories are uncovered by simply seeing something off in the distance and deciding to venture towards it. And one of these things you may stumble upon early on is the Shofra River well in the Mistwood Forest, which just so happens to be right near where you start the game off in this massive and dense map. Technically, the Shofra well can also be reached from a multitude of different ways, but for most players, this will be their first introduction. Deep within the forest is a strange circular building that screams synthetic in an area otherwise characterized by all natural surroundings. And if you approach this foreboding building, you find nothing more than a massive elevator sitting dormant. And should you decide to activate this mechanical beast, you will start slowly descending into the crust of the earth. But instead of being met by only rocks and empty caves, you instead are greeted by one of the most fantastical zones in the entire game, the Shofar River. Constellations and stars blanket the ceiling where stalactites should sit, and an ominous mist stands at attention in the distance. Hordes of undead and formidable beasts lurk in the depths of this strange place. More than anything, finding this zone for the first time is so fantastical and breathtaking, but the adventure is only getting started. Because as you go forth into this new underground world, you discover a strange pillar with a brazier attached to it, which you can light up. And if you look out into the distance, you will find a massive dead deer carcass that suddenly alights with life at one point on its massive skeleton. It immediately becomes clear that there are seven other points on its body missing this heroic light and it can quickly be deduced that only by lighting more pillars can we bring the beast to life. So you must fight your way through hordes of enemies and the environment itself, all of which is completely new to you, in order to light each brazier, after which you can return to the dead deer's body, 
and uncover one of, if not my single favorite boss in the entire game. Interacting with a corpse transports you into a perplexing, almost dreamlike area even deeper underground. And within this area is a massive sprawling cave that is home to the ancestral spirit of the Chauffeur River. Bombastic yet oddly calming music begins to sweep the scene as the deer awakes from its slumber and begins to glide through the air ready for battle. Blue crystals and stars leak from the deer's hooves and it stomps on the ground in an attempt to kill you, swiftly getting ready for another strike. And what follows is perhaps one of the easiest boss fights in the entire game, but also one, one of my favorites. And that's because everything about this boss, the music, the environment, and most importantly, how you even got here in the first place, shows just how great of a journey or quest it really was. Because sometimes the single best memories of a game are adventures like this, that don't even have a single line of dialogue, but rather focus on giving the player agency to discover things for themselves and a payoff at the end that makes it all worth it. Not everything has to be so rigidly structured, and not every quest and mission in a game has to hold the player's hand the entire way through. Often, it's those journeys that we discover on our own, those stories that we uncover without any help that will last with us the longest. And it goes to show why this type of game design, the FromSoft formula, has become so popular and beloved because it takes traditional quest structures and spins them on their head, asking so much from the player, but also giving them back so much in return as well. The Call of Duty series is no stranger to industry-defining main missions full of bombastic set pieces and Hollywood acting, but there is one specific COD mission that for me at least set the series up for becoming the juggernaut it is nowadays. Because you see, on a list like this, a lot of fans of the franchise would pick something like No Russian because of the cultural impact it had, but I think a mission that came in the game before it is the real most memorable in COD history, all gillied up from the original Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. The mission starts with you going into a flashback playing as Captain John Price deep in the heart of Ukrainian territory around a decade after the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. You have to slowly crawl and hide as you infiltrate this Russian ultranationalist soldier infested territory and throughout each step you are nearly caught as men with huge guns pass by. Eventually though you make your way into an abandoned Polisa hotel to prepare to assassinate Imram Zakhid where you will set up on the upper floors and slowly wait while his entire entourage approaches. Acting as the shooter with a spotter by your side, you wait for the perfect moment to take your shot over a mile away, and if you miss, it's mission over. It's one of the most iconic missions in the entirety of Call of Duty, and while it isn't my absolute personal favorite, I do think it's the most legendary because of how it showed how Call of Duty could handle the slower moments too. This game was the one that preceded Modern Warfare 2, which increased the intensity up even more, but without founding and pivotal missions like All Gillied Up, the series may have never reached the highs it eventually did. And more than anything, for many of us that grew up playing Call of Duty and loving every aspect of it, whether that be multiplayer, zombies, or the campaign, missions like this were a huge part in setting the series up to become the cultural phenomenon it did and why so many people fell in love with COD campaigns in the first place. And nowadays, it feels like every entry has standout missions that feel really epic, but this, this is where it all started. Skyrim is no stranger to noteworthy and engaging side quests, oftentimes beckoning the player to explore and even read journals and books in the environment to really piece together what happened on each adventure. In a way, it's the type of storytelling Bethesda are best at, because where they lack in traditional story and character writing, they make up for in crafting environments that tell a narrative all to their own, and let players unravel the mystery instead of it being served to them on a silver platter of dialogue and exposition. And it's this exact formula that has led their games to feel so unique and interesting while also having so many superstar quests and missions. But for me, there's one specific standout quest that doesn't get as much recognition as a lot of others in the game that is the Bethesda formula at its best and is such a legendary quest for me because it perfectly shows why these games are so special. Titled Frostflow Abyss, you can stumble upon this quest simply adventuring out into the wilderness in Skyrim. You spot an inviting looking cabin and home in the distance, but as you approach you notice a strange 
strange scent of death, with a dead horse laying just outside the front door. But this is only the start of death and despair in this quest, because once you push open the door to this quaint and quiet family home, you are immediately met with a scene of blood smeared all over the ground and walls, along with a woman with a sword stuck right through her chest in the middle of the room. Upon closer inspection, you notice that this weapon that killed this poor lady is actually that of a Falmer, who are an ancient race of previous snow elves that reigned over Skyrim, but were said to have been cursed by the Dwemer of the time, turning them into blind and rabid monsters that live underground and kill anything on sight. What on earth would a weapon like this from a Falmer be doing in the middle of the mountain range immediately begins to flow to the top of your head. But nonetheless, the oddities only stack up more once you notice food and kitchenware strung all about, along with the skeleton of a massive dead Charis insect being near the fireplace. If you inspect the body of the dead woman too, you can find a journal written by the father of the home that goes into detail about how they purchased it as a family with two children and were so excited to finally have a place to themselves. But strange noises were being reported over and over from the cellar of the house, after which the husband left to get traps and catch what he thought were rats, only to return to find the woman dead in the center of the room with a Charis scattering around. Using his red guard might, the man decimated the Charis and left his body by the fireplace, after which he wrote that he would be going into the cellar to save the rest of his family, making that your next goal too. If you decide to take your time and investigate all the rooms in the house as well, you can read more journals that reveal more about all of the scratching and weird sounds that were coming from the cellar, along with stories of the children missing the big port cities where they used to live and general talks between the family about their new home and what they loved and also didn't love about their new lives. They were worried. Eventually you can discover a key in a burial urn above the fireplace, or if your lockpick skill is high enough, open the cellar door for yourself. And here you are propelled into a massive underground icy cave network with tons of charis running around you must engage in battle with. Snow and ice have overtaken all of the family supplies and furniture here, and the culprit becomes crystal clear when you find a massive gaping hole in one of the walls, which leads to an even deeper underground cave network that you guessed it is home to the elusive Falmer and their pets. Through a series of notes you discover along with bodies of family members, you can piece together how they were kidnapped and tortured by the Falmer adversaries. But the most tragic of these is one of the daughters who was kept in a cage and starved while she cried for her father to save her, eventually taking her own life with a knife that her father was able to slip to her and alleviate her from her hell. And finally, at the end of the underground dungeon beneath the house, you find the body of the father himself, who with injuries and hypothermia crawled his way to the end of this cave, all in an effort to save his family, where he perished. And as a last sign of respect for the valiant efforts of this man, you take his remains to the top of the house, to the tippy top of the lighthouse, and burn them away into the night sky, gaining a permanent buff that increases your healing by 10% for the rest of the game. You see, the thing about this quest is it isn't the most in-depth, the longest, or even the most involved in Skyrim, not even by a long shot. But what it is, is the Bethesda formula at its best. Stumbling upon an interesting location atop a mountain range you didn't expect to find, uncovering a harrowing story about a family and love where you least expect it, along with an army of monsters to fight, and a great payoff of loot at the end that makes it all worthwhile. Truly though, this level of environmental storytelling in such a tight and well-defined quest that takes less than an hour is what Bethesda games are all about, and this sits as the gold standard of why these games live on in our memories forever. Sometimes the most legendary quests don't need a cool twist or gimmick or a lot of talking and narrative, but rather just good old-fashioned engaging storytelling in a world and environments filled to the brim with wonder and excitement. If you thought the wasteland of Fallout was dire and depressing, then you haven't played Underrail. Because where Fallout has open plains, creepy critters, and wacky vaults, Underrail is played entirely in a massive underground network of rail lines full of murderers, psychopaths, cannibals pulling people apart limb from limb, and the most godforsaken enemy ever put in a video game. Everything about the experience is Fallout but on steroids, to the point where the game can actually be agonizing to even play at times because it really makes you feel like you are a lonely soul trapped in the worst place imaginable in gameplay and story alike. And in any sort of environment like this, you are bound to stumble upon some seriously out there or insane quests and missions. But sadly, Underrail focuses mainly on brutally difficult combat and a propensity for making the player really struggle to survive more. Despite that though, there are still some absolutely amazing and memorable quests in the game, including being captured and escaping from a serial killer in their own home or living through a madman's dream. 
games. But the one that really takes this game to the next level, for me at least, is a quest that sheds light on the insanely fascinating lore of this world and leaves you with even more questions than answers. The journey to Oculus. You see, Oculus is a highly remote and unknown part of the game that is literally blocked from almost anyone getting in because of use of unknown psychic powers. But if you manage to befriend an in-game NPC named Asif, you stand a chance. But you see, quests in Underrail are just as hardcore as the game itself, and in order to actually even be granted to this strange place, you have to complete multiple other quests in extremely specific ways. That way Asif will open your mind to the new spot. These quests and their conditions are so specific though that it would almost be impossible to ever actually stumble upon Oculus without trying. You have to do things like convince specific people they are innocent and have no evidence against them on trial only to see them evicted, followed by not framing certain characters for other murders, and then talking to specific NPCs at very specific timings all after one another. It's a ridiculous setup for a quest even being triggered in the first place, but because of that, it makes the outcome actually rare and thus actually interesting. Because in the game's lore, literally almost no human beings even know about Oculus itself. So having to reach through all these hoops to even just have a small chance of actually getting there makes it actually live up to its special meaning. But nonetheless, the core of why I love this mission isn't the tedium you have to suffer or the wiki you have to read to reach it, most of which you can't even reliably research online and have to figure out for yourself because of how niche and underground this game is, but it's because of what happens once you get there. You are met with by far the coolest reveal and best location in the entire game. When you first happen upon Oculus, you are greeted by a massive underground, extremely vertical superstructure of sorts. And at the center is what is known as the mainframe, a monolith whose real purpose isn't even known by the Oculites that inhabit this area. It's thought to be a massive supercomputer, database, prophetic messenger, or even a sleeping god. But regardless, after talking with more of the people and guards here in this hidden location, you learn that this area and all of its highly advanced technology and ancient ruins are thought to belong to what are known as the Godmen, an ancient precursor race of sorts that we know little about. But the one thing that the Oculites and their warriors known as Whisperers have been able to uncover is that the prime directive of this place was one of surveillance and espionage. Many of the computers and databases here are home to detailed accounts of different characters in the world and past events, and you can scour through all of this to your heart's content to unlock some of the biggest secrets in the game, which I won't spoil here. But even with all of this lore and data to unpack, it still leaves us with even more questions than answers. Like who exactly were the godmen? How did they get access to such advanced technology? And does this give us clues as to what might have happened to humanity in the past and who we were and what we stem from? And also, how do we end up building these railways and getting here in the first place? To me too, this quest is so legendary because it happens in a game that otherwise doesn't place any sort of massive emphasis on lore at all. The world of Underrail is absolutely fascinating and begs to be understood, but for the majority of the time you play, you will be more worried about combat and how to survive in this extremely difficult world. But deep down, you'll always have that itch where you'll be wondering how this world even came to be, what exactly is the past, or more info on just how all of the lore works. Answers like this are only addressed infrequently and in small doses here and there, and it really leaves you wanting more the entire time. So randomly discovering through an abnormal sequence of decisions that there is a super advanced precursor race of ancient godmen with access to all powerful tech and psychic powers that lived underground that may hold the answers to the birth and fall of humanity itself in a world so full of dread and uniqueness that begs to be known that is absolutely mesmerizing coming here for the first time on this quest. It takes what was such a bare bones yet mysterious game and story and turns it into a world that is deserving of multiple games and developers working on it to create something that could surpass even the likes of Fallout. And more than anything, it also is probably one of the most obscure and least well known quests that packs a bigger punch than a lot of main narratives out there. And if there was one quest to play an entire game for, it's this one. But as always, thank you all for watching. The support and growth on this channel has been insane, and I really appreciate all the kind words and constructive criticism alike on how I can improve every day. I try to always make the videos better with each one and make the content more enjoyable for you guys as I keep learning and growing as a creator. And check out the links to my social media if you want to see my opinions on other things as well or what I look like. And consider the membership program here right on this channel if you want to support me financially to grow this channel and make more and higher quality content for you guys in the future. Until next time.